I invite you to look at Scripture with me. Um, I never know whether to apologize or simply uh, rejoice in the richness of text that we have for today. Um, we are back in common time, in ordinary time, uh, and so we have two messages, uh, two scriptures this morning. Both of them are a little lengthy, uh, but they're very rich, and I hope that you will follow along with me. Our first comes from 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, beginning at the 20th verse. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. First he repaired the altars of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones he built an altar to the name of the Lord. Then he made a trench around the altar large enough to contain two measures of seed. Then he put the wood in order, cut the bowl in pieces, and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And again he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, the prophet Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings, the wood, the stones, and the dust, and even licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Our second reading is from Luke, the seventh chapter, beginning at the first verse. After Jesus had ended all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a slave who was dear to him, who was sick and at the point of death. After hearing about Jesus, the centurion sent elders of the Jews to ask Jesus to come and heal his slave. And when they came to Jesus, they begged earnestly, saying, The centurion is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation and built us our synagogue. Jesus went with them. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying, O Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you. But say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled at the centurion and turned and said to the multitude that followed, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. 
And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. <coughs> Excuse me. The word of the Lord for the people of God. These are two great stories, and the lectionary leaves out the, the really neat part in the, in the Elijah story about that Elijah um, goes up to the mountain and they have this contest about whose God is real, whose God is the most powerful, and so he invites all the prophets of Baal up to the mountain and they're going to have this contest of who can, can get their offering to God to burn first. And so Elijah... Uh, teases the, the folks from the prophets of Baal and, and they set up their altar and they set up their sacrifice and they begin to do their incantations and nothing happens and Elijah begins to encourage them and say, well, maybe if you walk around the altar, maybe, maybe if you go you know, do a dance around the altar and, and maybe if you chant, that'll get God's attention and God, your God will come and do this. And, and he keeps egging them on and then that's when the second piece that, that Elijah really intends to humiliate them because he has essentially drowned the altar of Yahweh on this mountain to demonstrate that even the drowned altar can be set afire by the power of God. Um, it's a fascinating story, and it's not the subject of the sermon this morning, but I couldn't let that pass because uh, it, it, it's a lot more interesting when you uh, can... Uh, connect with the, the humor and the sarcasm of Elijah as he's talking to the prophets of Baal. Like, you know, maybe he's asleep. Maybe if you chant, he'll wake him up. You know, he's, maybe he's just not paying attention. Uh, maybe he's on his cell phone. Uh, you, can, you can get his attention. Um, this piece in Luke, however, I think really has a lot more connection and a lot more power for us in our lives today. Um, Almost 50 years ago, I had my first experience um, with authority, you know, real authority outside of my own family. I mean, we all grow up knowing that you have to pay attention to mom and dad, and if you're lucky enough to have, have grandparents, you know, you, you grow up in that model of kind of paying attention to what's going on in the house, what's going on in the household, and, and learning about authority within the household and who can say what and who can't say what and who's in charge. I mean, I'm, I'm learning this having two grandchildren um, uh, in, in my house right now. Um, they were at the table yesterday morning eating breakfast and the subject of the downtown water pad in Winchester came up and how it would be neat to take the kids down there and uh, uh, one of my grandson's parents piped up and said, oh, well, it's broken. And Quentin, who you have met, is sitting there at the table and chomping down on some pancakes. And he looks up and he says, oh, well, Pop Pop could fix that. Um, and that's how we grow up in our lives is that, you know, even at that early age, we're paying attention. You know, who fixes, who decorates, who cooks, who cleans, you know, who does laundry. We got all that down and he's not even three years old yet. We also learn in those family connections, we learn who to go to ask for things, even that early. Um, you know, Quentin already knows which books to ask to be read at bedtime, depending on which parent or grandparent is likely to put him to bed. Because he's very careful to pick out the books that he knows that that parental authority likes to read. It's uncanny. This kid is, will, will not be three until October, and already he knows how to manipulate, you know, he's got us all on strings. Well, almost 50 years ago was my first experience outside the family of dealing with authority. Um, I worked at a camp not far from here, actually, over in the Catoctin Mountains. Um, it was called Camp Greentop, and it was run for crippled children um, by the Baltimore League for Crippled Children and Adults. And it was an eight-week camp for crippled children from Baltimore. Mostly they were uh, polio or cerebral palsy survivors. 
Um, some of them were, were very, very handicapped. Others were not so much. Um, and uh, it was a, an idyllic place. It was a wonderful place. My first year there, I was the handyman, uh, which meant that I got to go clean out all the drains, and, um, which is something when you're at a summer camp with lots of showers going on. And, um, and so uh, in the middle of the summer every year, uh, up on Catoctin Mountain, and it is it was camp number three private. For those of you who know um, that, that part of the world, um, uh, Camp David is camp number two private, and it sits directly across the road from, uh, from this particular camp that I worked at. Um, and as it happened, in the middle of the summer every year, they used to have this thing that they called the Special Olympics, and it was... It was just a kind of a field day for these kids, and it was usually around July 4th, and it was a great time. Uh, farmers used to come and bring us, give us watermelon. In fact, they gave us so many watermelon one year that we got into all kinds of foolishness with it because there were just too many. And we knew that, you know, I mean, like we had 500 watermelon lined up on the outside of the cafeteria. There was no way that 100 children and adults were going to eat all those watermelon. Um, and so my dad is out, my mother and dad came to visit us that weekend, and my dad was out turning the totem pole outside of the uh, office as you come into the camp. There was this little office building, little log cabin with an office building, and, um, and there was a totem pole out front. And every year we would take the wings off the totem pole and put little rods around the outside of it, so it would look like an Olympic torch. And we would, you know, we'd make paper mache or tissue paper flames to come out of the top of it, and it it was quite a fun thing. And after supper, Dad was out there and he volunteered to fix this uh, this thing up, and he had removed the wings and he was in the process of putting these rods on the outside of it. And uh, as we were taking the children down after the campfire uh, to their units for, to go to bed, in the last light of evening, in comes three Cadillac limousines, one of them with no top. Now, for those of you who are quick at math, this was the summer of 1964. And... My dad, who was, uh, I'll talk about him in a minute, but dad was, was a pretty straight shooter. He was a major in the Army during World War II, and, you know, everything was, he, he had boundaries that were really clear to him, and you were either in charge or you weren't in charge, and if you were in charge, you were supposed to know what was next, and if you weren't in charge, you were supposed to be no one who did know what was next and be right there in front of him, ready to do the next thing. He was the one who taught me, if you're not there five minutes early, you're already late. So he's out there with this rod in his hand, and these three Cadillacs come running in, and he runs out into the middle of the road with this rod in his hand and saying to the driver in the first vehicle, you can't go in there. And of course, you know what happens next. A half a dozen Secret Service men are jumping out of the following vehicle with their guns drawn, taking a bead on my father with his pine rod like he's going to kill President Johnson with that, right? And it just, the president had decided it was a nice night. Uh, he'd never seen any of the other camps. He'd heard about this, this uh, uh, handicap camp, and he thought he would take his dog over and show it to the children. So he was going, but the roads in this camp are so narrow that, you know, my dad's concern was, you got a hundred handicapped children on these very narrow, sparsely paved roads going down into this camp, and it's dark, and you can't see anything. That's a, that's a real prescription. Well, dad got out in front of this car, and just as he looked up into the back seat of the first car that had no top on it, he realized what was going on, and he did the very best imitation of a picador in a, in a Madrid um, uh, bullfight and goes, of course, Mr. President, it's your camp. Dad knew about authority. I always think of Dad when I read this passage. 
because he could see the world through this centurion's eyes. And this centurion is truly, truly interesting and magnificent. Because like the centurion, my father had been a battery commander with about the same number of men under him as a centurion would have had. And he was in World War II in the Pacific Theater. He was um, in the battle for New Guinea. And he took 100 men from the 41st Division um, to the Pacific Theater in the worst war that we had ever fought to that point. And he lost one man. Now, for those of you who are interested in the military or experienced with the military, to take 100 men to battle and bring 99 back, that's an achievement. And the reason that they came back was that they all paid attention to what he told them to do about taking care of themselves. And like the centurion, my father was a respecter of authority. He always treated others in public service as though they were his commanding officer. And it didn't matter whether it was a traffic cop or a clerk behind the tax window. It even extended to our life at home. He never went into my mother's kitchen, and it was my mother's kitchen, you have to understand, for something to eat or drink without first getting permission. Most of the time she would say, sit down, I'll go get it for you. To which he responded, yes, ma'am. And though he rarely showed anger in public, he frequently took other people's rudeness simply in stride. And when I would say something to him, he would say, you have no idea what's going on in that person's life that makes them act that way. Just let it go. The centurion had a slave who was his dear friend. But the slave was sick, even to the point of death. And being reluctant to go himself, he sends a group of Jewish elders to the village to go see Jesus, to ask on his behalf. They go telling Jesus what a fine person this centurion is. And it is extraordinary that you have a Roman soldier who is that well thought of in the Jewish community who, maintaining good boundaries, sees himself separate from the Jewish community but at the same time a supporter enough to have built them a synagogue. And he says quite deferentially to Jesus, who was not anyone who should have been paid attention to by a Roman soldier. Indeed, we know in the story of the Passion how rudely he is treated by the soldiers. Do not trouble yourself, he tells Jesus. I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I do not presume to even to come to you but say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. <coughs> Hearing this, Jesus marveled at him, and turned to him, and said to the multitude that followed him, I tell you, not in Israel have I found such faith. And when those had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave well. The centurion not only knew authority when he saw it, he responded as one who expected God to be God. He could commit his faith when he had only heard about Jesus because he took the good news at face value. Jesus came preaching and teaching, healing the sick, making the blind to see and the lame walk. The centurion opened his life to the power which had come in the good news, not because he accepted a set of doctrines, not because he recited a creed, but because he knew people in authority. 
He had lived his life and made his living in a service which required expecting people of authority to exercise that power with honesty and in keeping with what they said they would do. That was probably one of the most extraordinary contributions of Roman culture to the modern world was the expectation that the administration of civil authority would be done efficiently, honestly, and by the book. They literally wrote it. The remarkable thing about the centurion is not his faith, but that rather as an uh, outsider observing the work of God amidst the people of Israel, he can see very plainly what is going on. He doesn't even need to know the scripture foretelling the coming of Jesus. Because he can look at what's going on and saying, only the power of God can do that. He doesn't need a proof text to prove Jesus is the Messiah. Certainly it is not clever, it is not that he was clever enough to predict the healing of the power of Jesus when many others had already been healed, but that he correctly perceived the power of God was in Jesus. And it wasn't just a power of magic. This first centurion in Luke's writing acts as a counterpoint to the lack of faith in the people of Israel. While Israel possessed the knowledge of God through the revelation in the Old Testament, this centurion only has his good sense and understanding. And you remember that Luke gives us a second centurion in Acts who acts even more dramatically to open the gospel to the Gentiles. It is this ability to recognize spiritual authority which still gives us anxiety today. Whom should we believe? Which TV preacher do we listen to? What religious publication do we accept as authoritative? How do we make our way through the world? You know, I have, I have some frustration, I must admit, over the years. Um, I know a lot of people um, who say, you know, I have a spiritual life. I just don't go to church. And this isn't meant to be a, please come to church, you need to be in church. It's just that when I hear people say that, and especially people who I figure should know better, I don't know how we do this without being in relationship with one another with an external authority which we call scripture to help us find our way in the world without somehow being attached to a community of others who also believe that God is God and in authority. I think it's wonderful to have spiritual feelings, and I have to tell you, I've, you know, I, I have begun walking an hour every morning, and I'm feeling better for it, and, and when I can get far enough away from the gas fumes, uh, I'm feeling uh, much better about the world and, and have a, a lower blood pressure and, and a greater sense of God's natural creation. But I have to tell you, as a whole, while nature is wonderful and inspiring and all the rest of that, I can't see how that fills the need to know what God's word is. Oak trees are nice. They don't point out my sinfulness. Maybe that's why I like to spend time with them, because they're not so rude as to point out where I fall short of the grace of God. For me and for many, and I hope for many of you, Church, being in a fellowship of others, is a spiritual oasis from the erosion and corrosion of what goes on in the rest of our lives. 
that you can't find on the television or in the hunting lodge or at the racetrack or even in our beds when we're too tired to get up. For the result of not paying attention to our spiritual lives is that over time we lose the ability, like Israel, to recognize the power of God when it comes near to us, just as Israel did in the time of Jesus. We become dulled to the possibility of a spiritual life, and we begin to expect that spiritual renewal comes from something else than being related to God and spending time in Scripture. A ball team, a race car, hunting in the woods, and we're always disappointed when it leaves us tired, drained, and still dissatisfied with our lives. Just as tired Monday morning as Friday afternoon. Well, as my father would have said, what do you expect? What I would say is that it's, first of all, never too late to reconnect with God. It doesn't monopolize our time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have some great conversion experience in the midst of it. I have a friend down in Louisiana who, before Katrina, was, as he admits, a cultural Christian. He went to church occasionally. He enjoyed the fellowship of the congregation. But he never really prayed outside of church. He never really engaged in any spiritual discipline of his own. And he never really resorted to God when things were good or bad. As he said, I prayed in church and I depended on my own will and ability the rest of the week. Well, Katrina hit. And as he tells the story, and I can't tell it as well as he does, he says he woke up one day, I had no lights, no air conditioning, a car that needed work, a washing machine that needed repair, and a freezer full of, fru of melting food. And a wife who was very unhappy with all of it. He claims that on the very first day after Katrina, as he was trying to figure out how to get his car started, someone came by the house and was inquiring about whether they could borrow his car to go get some supplies for some neighbors who lived up the road. And he said, there is my car. It doesn't work. And they said, that ain't a problem. I'm a car mechanic. So he goes over and he spends about 30 minutes working on the car and he gets the car running. So my friend says, well, how much do I owe you? He says, nothing. Can we go up here and get some supplies? Will you go with me and help me carry him back? He says, sure. All the time he's thinking, okay, I prayed to God and said, God, I have no way to go get supplies for my family and now all of a sudden I'm engaged in the process of getting supplies for the whole community and my car's fixed. He said after the, air, after the power came back on, his wife was giving him a hard time about not being able to clean any clothes because the washing machine was still in need of repair and they didn't exactly have enough money to go buy a new one. When there comes another knock on the door, his immediate next door neighbor comes to him and says, I just had Sears deliver a washing machine to my house uh, and they want to charge me $25 to haul off the old one. Uh, it still works. Do you know anybody who needs it? So my friend says, yes, sir, I do. Bring it right in here. <laughs> and I think I can arrange to get rid of my old one. It proceeded like that, and every day, he said, he began getting up in the morning, and he began to pray, not for specific things from God, but just, God, help me make it through this day. Just help me make it through this day. Point me in the right direction. Well, the 
end of the story is that it's not over. My friend began to work with a group that rebuilt homes in New Orleans after Katrina. And he became so enmeshed in the work of the church and so enthralled with the possibility that out of nothing, literally, whole new communities could emerge. That he decided to go and get trained about how do you talk about this stuff? How do you preach? How do you teach? How do you share the gospel? And now a little church in rural Louisiana has a pastor. Because after Katrina, somebody knocked on the door and asked him to come help. And something within him made him recognize the power of God in that movement in his life. So that now what's funny is that he's a little less available to help with disaster work because he's a whole lot more available to this little congregation of people who need his pastoral care every day. For some people it takes an accident of a disaster. For others it takes just a washing machine in very unlikely circumstances. But there's always the opportunity to recognize and be awed by the power of God in our lives if we will be open to what it is we actually see, not what our plan is or what we'd like to see done, but offer our hopes and dreams and visions to God and then see how they are played out in front of our very eyes. And that's the good news that I came to share with you today. Amen.